Welcome to 99 to 1. Today I'm joined by Ina Mikaeli, uh, Alice Garcia, and Anna Estayunas for the second time. All right, let me introduce each and every one of you first. So, um, very first, Anna, she was already here, as I said. Uh, Anna Estayunas is an independent researcher and research consultant. She works on race critical theories and is interested in psychoanalytical theories. Her focus is on modern Germany and the so-called anti-Semitism discourse in Germany and beyond. Her work can be accessed on her personal website or on academia.edu. Um, we talked last time about a legal case that uh, you are um, basically fighting out right now. A and little bit only, unfortunately. We, we just mentioned that yes. real quick in the end, I think. And um, there are a couple of other people also uh, joining that legal case. And Ina Mikhaili is... Uh, Another one of these people, uh, she's a sociologist and feminist queer activist, board member of the Jewish Voice for Peace in the Middle East. Is that's the that's not the German one, right? Are you with the Jewish Stimme yeah, or it's just the Jewish Stimme? Okay, okay. Um, and prior to coming to Germany, she lived in Israel Palestine and worked for the Coalition of Women for Peace. She's active in various feminist, queer, migrant, and anti-colonial grassroots initiative. And last but not least, we have uh, Alice Garcia. Um, yeah, advocacy and communication manager of the European Legal Support Center. We're going to talk about this a bit also in the conversation now, the so-called ELSC, the only organization in Europe that's actually providing support uh, to Palestinian um, rights advocates and lawyers, basically, that um, represent Palestinians. Mm -hmm. uh, a year ago now, I think, a bit more than a year ago, Anna was here and we already hinted at... Uh, a little bit at a legal case that was going on, um, especially regarding your case with, uh, well, I'll let you talk about this in a second. Maybe why don't you just explain about the situation? Why are we here today? What, what are we talking about? Go ahead. I can, I can kick us off. Yeah. Um, <coughs> hi, Oops. everyone. Lovely to be sitting around this table with you all. Um, I mean, we are here to tell and to speak about a political story of uh, challenging German institutions, and it is a story that is both personal and collective. So we are also here because we don't, we, we, we're not here to cry, we are not here to be victims, but we really want to speak and, you know, about our own agency, also about our achievements and our wins, um, about solidarity, about the changes that we want to see and that we are making in society as well through our resistance and, and the political work that we are doing, um, even when the kind of the institutional forces and the system makes it very difficult for us. Yeah, thanks, Inna, for that. And also thank you, Alice and Nadine, for um, being here, and especially to you guys for hosting us again. I think you've hosted several of us, of this community that you uh, yes. refer to, Inna, right now already in, in, in different podcasts. Um, so I guess that is just a, a follow-up on the many other people who came to your show already. And um, I think what I really like about your podcast, I already said this last time, is that it's a... Uh, It's an anti-institutional, outside of an institution podcast, which I really appreciate and which is why we're sitting here and coming to you guys um, and not a more institutionalized um, online show. And yes, we don't want to be victims. Um, I think within this discourse that um, affects um, Jews and Palestinians or pro-Palestinian activists alike, very often we are framed as these almost already dead bodies that have nothing to say anymore because we've already been symbolically shot in public. Um, and I think we would like to point out that we are actually fighting back and that people can learn a little bit of and how to resist from us. Alive and kicking. Alive and kicking, even if uh, this is not part of the institutional conversation. Yeah. Let's talk about the case a lot, So what, uh, a little bit. So what, what is that case? Um, what's the background of all of this? Um, we alluded a little bit uh, to that case. We couldn't talk so much about it the last time you were around, um, but we alluded a little bit about uh, you know, the, the troubles that you had. Uh, can, you, can you maybe explain a little bit what was going on? So um, what happened was that I was disinvited um, from an event that was organized by the left, Die Linke, on anti-Muslim racism and strategies against the new right or um, neo-Nazis in particular. I was disinvited, um, as I learned two weeks later, um, based on a, a dossier, um, a.k.a. of a secret file that was sent by RIAS slash MBR, Mobile Beratungsstelle gegen Rechts, um, 
um, to get me disinvited, basically. Within this document, I'm um, alluded to as someone who is supportive of anti-Semitic, um, uh, what I would like to call anti anti-Jewish racism. Um, so anti-Semitic um, uh, 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 undertones is <laughs> supportive of Islamism and sexism. And just one sec mm. uh, for the, I mean, for the viewers that are obviously not from Germany. Yeah. Uh, what's Rias? Um, the um, Recherchestelle, um, the research center uh, on issues of anti-Semitism, and the other one is the um, Mobile Center against right-wing extremism, if that's the proper... Yeah. Um, and those are state institutions or private institutions? No, those are NGOs basically funded by the German state. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the okay. point. Um, but we're going to go into detail about okay. that. And they right. sent a secret file, or they assembled at least... We know that about me now, which is kind of paradigmatic, let's say, but we assume there are other cases, mm -hmm. um, um, to get me disinvited, to not basically appear in public, even on an issue of anti-racism, or in this particular case, anti-Muslim racism and right-wing extremism. Um, um, yeah, so that is what happened. And then two weeks later, I learned from someone within the party um, several people, in fact, and they told me that there is this file circulating. Mm -hmm. And um, so after two weeks, uh, someone leaks it to me. And that is how this uh, conversation here uh, started, how the legal lawsuit started. Um, on the day that I was disinvited and the, where the event took place, the woman um, of Die Linke in charge of this event as well, Katina Schubert, um, has also alluded Uh, in my absence to me being compared to someone who is a white supremacist, white white supremacist um, shooter who wanted to um, storm into a synagogue on Yom mm -hmm. Kippur in 2019 and was unsuccessful and therefore shot a woman in front of the synagogue um, and then went on to uh, another killing spree at a donor shop. <clears throat> um, yeah. So <laughs> that's what happened. And now we, since we assume that there's more cases like that, and that's, that's why we are here. I think it's not just one legal case um, of me where one file has been discovered, but it's inherently political because what these smear campaigns do is that they put me and other people into this you know, Islamic, anti-Semitic um, sexism framework, and therefore you are... Um, almost morally cancelled in your character and person, even for the political economy that we live in, becomes unbearable and uh, you're objected. So that's why we are, I guess, here today. Yeah, I can talk about the case maybe from a legal perspective, as coming from uh, the ELSC, the European Legal Support Center. So basically what RIAS Berlin and MBR did is that They politically profile Anna because they are using the IHRA definition uh, to assess anti-Semitism, which we can go back to that um, later. In this dossier that contained uh, information about her, information that they packed um, and distorted and packaged in a certain way, and then they privately passed on this dossier to a third party with the effect of excluding Anna right. from a public event. So when Anna found out, what, we, what she did is that she requested um, VDK, which is VDK is the umbrella organization that legally represents um, RIAS Berlin and MBR. Um, so she asked them to uh, give the information they collected on her and to tell her how they use this, because this is a right that everyone has. Okay, It's the right to access um, your data from a company or an organization. Um, it's basically... Uh, protected by EU law and, of course, German law. So it's called the GDPR, um, privacy law. And it's really important because it's an issue of transparency and um, privacy, basically. So surprisingly, VDK just uh, refused to uh, release this information, claiming that they were carried out, uh, carrying out sorry, uh, journalistic um, activities. And academic And scientific, yeah, yes. indeed. So, um, therefore, they would be exempt from complying with these uh, privacy rules, which, of course, we disagree. And so what they did is really problematic, not only from a political point of view, but also from a legal point of view, because basically what they did is called data processing, which is allowed by EU uh, uh, privacy law and German uh, law as well. 
um, in itself it's allowed. But there are a few principles that uh, uh, we must respect there. And one of them is accuracy. So basically, um, the data must be that the, those organizations or company collect must be accurate. And in Anna's case, it was clear that uh, the data was put together in a way that misrepresented her opinion. Uh, and therefore, it was uh, inaccurate. So, um, and the second principle is purpose uh, limitation to data processing. So, um, basically, RIAS and MBR claim that the reason why they were uh, uh, processing this data was a journalistic and a scientific reasons, which is simply ridiculous uh, uh, given the content of the dossier, basically. Because the dossier was clearly sent to someone with the purpose to smear Anna and get her sanctioned but they had the audacity to claim uh, an exemption for journalistic and scientific uh, uh, reasons, and this is in no way journalism or uh, scientific work. And also another point is that we believe that this amounts to uh, surveillance. And yeah, so just to explain the, the legal steps that uh, Anna took through her lawyer and with the support of uh, the ELSC, um, so after RIAS, Berlin, and, and MBR, which I will call VDK for <laughs> simplification, um, refused to release the data, in June 2020, uh, she filed a complaint to the Berlin Data Protection Authority, that we, we call here the DPA, to order VDK to release the data on ANA and also recognize the unlawful data processing. So basically the violation of the two principles um, I just mentioned. And for one year and a half, uh, Anna waited for a final decision from the DPA. Almost two years. Yeah, mm -hmm. almost two years. That's why she took them to court for <laughs> inactivity. Mm -hmm. So urging them to release a final decision. And at the same time, Anna sued VDK um, directly for their refusal um, uh, of releasing the, the data and asking the judge to order this uh, release and also to acknowledge their uh, wrongful conduct, basically. And in addition to that, we decided to make the case public, um, to put public pressure on those two institutions because this must stop. Uh, and we want to raise awareness. Uh, um, we need to, the public to be aware of this undemocratic practices uh, operated that by publicly funded institutions, uh, precisely. So we published a support letter that was signed by more than 700 uh, academics, artists, uh, journalists, organizations, and activists. Uh, and we went to the media. Because again, we asking the respect of really fundamental uh, rights and basic rights. Um, so yeah, so the two lawsuits were uh, successful so far because uh, the civil lawsuit against VDK pushed them to release the dossier. Mm -hmm. So they released the full dossier and an important point is also that they acknowledge that the purpose actually uh, of collecting this data was to identify Anna's position on Israel and on the BDS. Mm -hmm. And second, uh, the administrative lawsuit against the DPA pushed them to issue a final decision, which gave us reason because um, the DPA rejected um, any exemption raised by RIAS Berlin and uh, uh, MBR because they also uh, acknowledged that uh, both failed to follow scientific methodology or a journalistic one. So this is very important. But what we think is that the DPA really missed... Um, two important points as well, because first they disregarded the unlawfulness of preparing and sending this dossier. And then um, the badge of guilt remains on Anna, um, because, you know, like her reputation, the damage made mm. to her reputation is not even addressed uh, mm. there. So the legal fight is not over. Uh, we will challenge the DPA's decision, and we will also ask uh, compensation from uh, VDK for denying Anna her right to access her data for um, two years. Okay, if I can chime in real quick, yeah. I think what I would like to add to that is that um, we went through data, um, data law, data rights, because we already also assumed that any kind of other legal uh, body um, would not sufficiently be able to address this case and for us to win um, because at the end of the day really the, the law uh, 
and and how it is used really much depends on who's in whose hands it is. <laughs> so um, data protection laws seem to be the safest route to take, in a way. Um, uh, and any other kind of uh, administrative or civil civil lawsuit, for instance, would have kind of pushed us more into a political. Um, legal um, debate, debate slash fight and usually those don't pan out quite well in front of German courts especially not for Palestinians um, I also would like to point out that Palestinian voices in this case are the the, the, the most marginalized in terms of legally or political represent, legal or political representation um, so yeah having said that um, we had to, and I want to make clear again, although the DPA case going for data protection rights of European citizens of which I thought I was one, um, and I still am one, um, we literally had to sue and went public because the DPA didn't start working or didn't, I mean, I don't want to say they didn't work on it, but they didn't um, come out with a legal statement. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like the war of attrition, right? And at some point, we just didn't have any recourse anymore. Therefore, we kind of went to the public because that was the only way we could kind of pressure them into... Um, a statement, actually. So we have a two-tire system, at least here in terms of even citizenship rights, I think. Um, anyways, I mean, that's also not news for many people. But whereas we have to perpetually um, claim our rights or uh, um, uh, demand them or prove ourselves to them, that's basically the case we're talking about right now. We're I was trying for two years to get my European data rights accepted, and now the DPA actually even said, and correct me if I'm wrong, that actually the, the filing and the collection of the data is legally correct, which is why we're going into the next um, lawsuit right now. But imagine if that is happening to someone who doesn't have um, German citizenship or European citizenship, and you come from an even more precarious status. When you, when you stop thinking from the nation state and, you know, as the, the, guarant, the, guarant, the guarantor of, of rights, then you really realize that uh, it's basically a privilege that only, um, <laughs> uh, that only um, happens, or not, that's not the word, but it's basically your rights as a European citizen then become a privilege of only a few. Um, and I think that's what I want to paint, uh, 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 point out in this, in this case. Um, yeah. And maybe just one important question which remains here as well is um, what about others? Um, you know, do RIAS and MBR also hold data about other people? Um, in Anna's case, there was a leak, but uh, it's likely that other people are targeted. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, what, you know, what looks like a uh, structural issue, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and some activists have already uh, filed data access requests, actually, and also face the same answer that mm. Anna receives, like, uh, we are protected by those mm. so-called journalistic scientific exemptions. <laughs> um, but, yeah, now the DPA has made clear that they cannot hide anymore behind those exemptions. Mm. So, um, yeah, we intend to challenge this uh, further in court and might maybe more people uh, will join the claim. I mean, it's interesting, you, you're speaking about others, and I've been thinking about what happened at the beginning of this year, I think in January or so, or was it December already? I don't remember. Where there was like this kind of mass cancellation of contracts at Deutsche Welle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So um, this kind of environment becomes ubiquitous now in, in state media and state institutions, I would say. So how would you, how, and your case is actually an older case, I mean, relatively older, a couple of years older, um, how um, do you think this, your particular case, reflects the situation of Palestinians here in, in Germany? Uh, I mean, it's one of surveillance. I think that's how I would simply call it. Um, and and to, to, to talk about or to kind of address the Deutsche Welle um, uh, cases um, and a lot of other cases, in fact, it's not the only ones, right? Sure, basically, sure, yes. usually you get uh, caught up in these war of technicalities where people basically use labor law or all kinds of exemptions as in like institutional culture or whatever it is. And then there's another, uh, you know, moral add on as to as it was uh, recently published by Deutsche Welle as well um, with the new code of conduct, if I'm if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. Um, which is also, it's not, a, it's not surprising to read this very um, pro-Zionist well, code of conduct. What, what's this code of conduct? Maybe explain this a little bit for people that don't know about the story. 
I think what becomes visible, but again, this is also nothing new. I've signed contracts as well with journalistic entities before when I was working as a journalist, where you basically had to sign uh, forms of disclosure and a code of conduct. And uh, usually it was the Springer Verlag, for instance, if I right. can name that now. Um, but it has become a more institutionalized, it's uh, uh, broadly speaking, German, European um, infrastructure uh, um, that demands usually now, um, and universities have thought about this, you know, um, not just Deutsche Welle, that makes it um, obligatory for employees to adhere to a political line that, for instance, it says supports the state of Israel and its right to exist. Um, and if you don't do that, politically speaking, for instance, as Deutsche Welle, the Deutsche Welle case has shown through Twitter posts, etc., personal Twitter posts, uh, not even as part of your job, <laughs> um, you could get fired. Um, yeah. And I think it's also, you know, like this this kind of um, repression when we know that there's surveillance against us or when, you know, you go to your workplace and you have nice relationships with your colleagues and then one day you are just fired. Um, and your whole idea about what is freedom of press and what is journalism is entirely shattered, even though theoretically it's the foundation of democracy and so on and so forth. But here you have a major broadcaster having code of conduct that actually limits freedom of expression and calling things by their name and saying the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think what I want to point out is how a lot of those bureaucratic um, kind of big and small instances of surveillance, they really, they just come to exhaust us. They just come to make us so tired that if, I think all of us, right, we have a lot of those instances where you know your rights have been violated or something that is happening is not okay. And like, theoretically, you know, you, you have the right to fight it, mm -hmm. but it takes so much resources and so much energy and money and time that many people simply don't have that I, I feel like the system is really based on the assumption that they can actually violate your rights quite a lot mm -hmm. and push you quite a lot and most people will just not get to the point of actually doing something about it because of the incredible effort that it requires mm -hmm. you know maybe not so so different from why you know so many uh, people, and especially women and gender diverse trans folks, don't go and yes. complain on sexual violence to the yes. police, you know, uh, because, you know, the system is actually working against and not for, you know, the justice that, 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 that you need. And so it's, it's, it's really one of the reasons that I admire you, Anna, for, you know, going through with this. No, because it is taking a lot of, you know, it's, you've been waiting just for that response for two years, right? So, yes. and, and I'm, you know, because I just really want to come into this conversation from the angle that this kind of, you know, political impact of, of, of this persecution that it has on us as, as human beings and this environment of surveillance and, you know, on, on our political freedom as well. And especially, right, as, as people in precarious situations without German papers or uh, residency status or as racialized people, as migrants. Yeah. Yeah, I, thank you for pointing that out, that this is actually a structure that, you know, um, in its uh, very much white supremacist um, uh, outcome, is not working and I think never worked for us to begin with. It never included us to begin with, which is why it's so easy to clamp down on us right now. And I think a lot of people, just like the journalism case, right? I'm an academic of, of racism or anti-racism, let's put it that way. I'm, I'm accused of anti-Semitism and that is how people um, then frame you and don't en engage with you anymore. So a lot of the, um, so the people that I talk to from the Deutsche Welle, it seems to be the same thing, right? Your own peers, your own journalistic peers or academic peers or whatever, you know, you know, fill in the gap, I think, um, just distance themselves from you. You become toxic for them, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, and it just becomes this, um, this, this moment and positionality where you are very much, at least it appears to be, and very often at least in terms of no institutional support, you are alone. You're very much alone, which is why so many people shy away from um, engaging or even, even supporting you because... Even if, they're, even if they are smeared themselves, they usually don't want to align themselves 
with another person that was smeared because that just compounds the smearing, you know, like very often. Like I don't want to be dragged into your smear mm -hmm. campaign because my smear campaign is already bad enough. That kind of, you know, yeah. been, the more precarious you become. But yeah. Because people are afraid. Exactly. Yeah. And that fear, I mean, from a legal point of view, it really creates a huge chilling effect. I mean, chilling effect is really too weak in that context, but the chilling effect on other individuals because the repression and the smear send the message that beware, because mm -hmm. beware of what you're saying, what you're publishing, because you might be tracked to, you might be humiliated in public. And this results in the fear of facing similar, very serious and concrete consequences, such as um, damage to reputation, dismissal, uh, exclusion from public space, from academia, financial burden, uh, losing your jobs. time losing your jobs mm -hmm. and mental health issues and as you said the feeling of being very alone in this and yeah this material and, and, and also legal consequences because you might be sued as well um, make people afraid uh, and that leads to self-censorship in a climate where you know freedom of expression uh, for an anti-imperialist decolonial voices is already a battleground so um, uh, yeah Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, a battleground. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a debate that is already... Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't want to... Yeah, no worries. You. No, but what I wanted to say is that um, the very state that, you know, maintains legal structures that seemingly should protect freedom of expression for every citizen um, also supports quasi-legal policies that undermine those uh, citizens' rights which leads to a perpetual second-class uh, uh, citizen position that has to fight to earn their rights, um, to their rights. <laughs> I mean, the, the right to access right. their rights, you know what I mean? <laughs> the right so, to have a right. Yeah. And yeah, and as you said, imagine if uh, you are not even a German citizen or if you're a refugee or... So yeah, and at the same time, uh, um, these policies, these quasi-legal policies, we'll get back to them as well later, but... Uh, they support misinformation about people here in Germany, but also about what's going on in Palestine and Israel. And this is a real threat to democracy, as you said, and the rule of law. Um, and I think also the chilling effect, chilling effect um, is also on the institutions themselves. Um, so people within the institutions who hold power, uh, responsibilities, uh, management, um, you know, they will instantly cancel or disinvite or withdraw, mm -hmm. even without properly reasoning beforehand. So they will not even ask themselves the right questions anymore. Like, you know, what does it mean to call for the end of the Israeli apartheid? What does it mean to uh, call for the respect of fundamental rights of the Palestinian people? Um, But they also, is, yeah. they also don't even engage with you anymore once you're smeared. But, you know, yeah, just, and yeah. and I think you can, you can actually go one step, be, you know, beyond a threat to democracy, and to say that this kind of conduct, which is you know, anti-democratic, authoritarian, um, outright criminal but legalized, um, it's it's not just a threat to democracy; it just it exposes the places where the democracy is failing. And I know it sounds a bit theoretical, but I think it's very practical when you are on the you are the one who is paying the price, right? Because you are the one who doesn't get the job, who gets excluded or fired or disinvited. And it's it's also just the stress that you feel in your body um, when you have to deal with this kind of, uh, you know, whether it's uh, surveillance or um, knowing that there's, um, yeah, there's, there's a whole, that you are the target of a political persecution and um, your means to defend yourself are very limited. Right, and I think like like um, building on that, um, it's not only. I, I would even go further. I think it's not only anti-democratic. I think we are already seeing a system um, rolling out its own carpet, which I would call fascist. Actually, um, at least we're on the way there, structurally speaking, in terms of what we are understanding and seeing on the ground already. Even if it's just um, so far restricted to mainly. Uh, Palestinian or Muslim voices or subjectivities. Um, but what I find so scary is that when you say that to people, and I remember when these things happened 10 years ago, people will look at you as though you are 
some kind of crazy person. You know, like how can an institution, how can people deal with you like that? There would always be this assumption, maybe she did something wrong. Like in Germany, not only in Germany, I suppose, you um, you are usually discriminated because you did something wrong. <laughs> That's what people think. There is no structural discrimination happening in Germany because we are the nation that has learned from its, mista its, its mistakes and also falls into this whole notion of European law and democracy as the apotem of uh, freedom and um, progress as well. So people can really not um, understand what is happening. So now the past couple of years, this is kind of becoming more and more visible because of some international um, um, popular cases which depends or depended on the international class status of the people being attacked. That's how I would call it. But still, I think what happened here on the ground for the past 20 years is something that has been overlooked so far. And maybe now people are understanding that this is not just, uh, that we're not only crazy, that this is something that is practiced on us now and it will um, affect more people in, in the future, I think. So I just want to come back to one thing you talked about. I mean, you talked a little bit about uh, basically the personal repercussions of this kind of repression on yeah, Palestinians and other voices that are being repressed. Uh, we do see at the same time this kind of dichotomy of this good versus the bad Palestinian. So especially in the Deutsche Welle case, this became very mm -hmm. prominent as our dear friend Ahmad uh, was part of this um, uh, witch hunt. So how do, how do you see that fitting together and how, um, you know, do you see any patterns there that you recognize from older studies or other studies you had? I think I would like to come back to the chilling effects in, in that matter um, that the ELSC and a couple of um, uh, reports that are coming out soon or have already been published that have used this terminology. Um, it's, it's there to, to, to kind of describe a certain political and legal climate And um, I have huge issues with this terminology, but I'm also not a lawyer. I'm not writing the reports because it doesn't feel like it's not like I'm going out and it's cold outside and I'm wearing a dress or something and then I'm a bit chilly, you know, like um, I think it's an it's, it's an understatement of what is actually happening. Um, and we should find better terminologies in this um, in this narrative war, which is what it is, I think. It's a narrative war. And I would go for um, the definition of actually of, of political and transnational apartheid <laughs> as something that we do not necessarily only see in Israel-Palestine happening, but as a transnational system uh, that extends, you know, uh, to Europe or even comes out of Europe, you could argue that. Um, and maybe you want to read the definition of apartheid real quick. I have it here. So yeah, apartheid refers to uh, crimes committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination, but one, sorry, by one racial group over any other racial group or groups and committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. And this is the definition of the Rome Statute. It's also the one that was uh, used by um, Amnesty International in mm -hmm. their report. Right, and I think that describes what is happening here in Germany a lot, or in Europe, actually, because you have cases from all over Europe um, a lot better. And the reason why I'm saying it is because uh, we can learn a lot from South Africa, I guess, <laughs> at least under apartheid, and from Steve Pico, whom I already referred to last time when I was with you. And uh, when he uh, became a student at the University of Durban, he realized that... Um, You know, white people basically maintain the structures of white supremacy at the same time that they, you know, define um, the liberal ways or the ways of how to fight that system. So you have basically white people defining white supremacy and apartheid, and at the same time they're defining how to fight against apartheid. Right? That was his. Uh, Steve Biko basically goes into this entire um, understanding and analysis of what he coins, you know, white liberalism, basically. Um, but yeah, it basically ends up, you know, where Palestinians are <laughs> invited in like backroom door meetings, you know, because it's too dangerous to be seen with us in public, um, which is exactly what <laughs> Steve Biko also wrote about, in fact, being invited to a tea party um, as the, the good black person, right? You're the good Palestinian. And uh, there's been a friend of mine, actually, she's been invited recently to an institutional um, event where they were frantically looking for a Palestinian apparently and couldn't find one um, so they asked her and she declined um, basically saying that had they would they know and would they just find out what I'm writing right 
they would shoot me in public just as they shoot, you know, shot Nami Al Hassan or so many other people before, right? But it kind of plays on this trope that, you know, there is this good Palestinian until we have shot you in public and then, you know, all the good Palestinians have been used up, everybody else is dead. And uh, uh, yes, I think, and, and another thing I think that is, that is what comes out of this good versus bad Palestinian, which is already a binary that is deeply racialized um, uh, uh, and um, problematic, Uh, I think it kind of relies on this very necrophilic, like um, death-like desire where we like to kill Palestinians, where killing Palestinians actually brings in our own humanity, you know? Like the minute you kill a Palestinian, that would be my argument right now, you actually become a human yourself. Um, and it always seems as though if you're the bad, pal like as long as you are still adhering to German or European or white structures of civility discourse, as I call it, and then they will find out that eventually you won't because it's your entire political identity that is already wrong. So you cannot actually say the right thing. At the end of the day, you will always be wrong. But then you're getting shot at, and through this killing of this wrong Palestinian, Europeans or white Germans can actually you know, celebrate their own humanity as Europeans with uh, progress and civil liberties and all kinds, and basically fighting anti-Semitism, right, by killing other people. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of appear as these zombies in German institutions. We pop up once in a while, and then people need to shoot us <laughs> in order to like, oops, we thought they were like humans, but then we realized they were zombies. Um, so yeah, that's, that's white supremacy to me. I think Palestinians have become zombies, and, uh, and uh, killing us seems to be some kind of a national at least symbolically and also materially in Palestine, is kind of like a, a systemic uh, sport. Um, Anna, you just a second ago you said something about um, necrophilia. Uh, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit on that, what, what that what means? For, that? Yeah, because that's probably a new term for many people. Um, so it basically means that you, um, or what I'm trying to say in relation to Palestinians is that Palestinians are predominantly represented or interpolated through a language or um, a symbolic representation of death or already being dead, uh, which is why we are constantly the victims um, and are not uh, alive anymore, the zombie that I brought up. And um, we are usually asked what happened to us tell me about your experience, how does it feel being persecuted, how does it feel, I don't know. Um, we have definitely a lot more to say than just talking about our uh, feelings. Um, and Sanabil Abdurrahman, who is a Palestinian researcher who uh, is getting her PhD in Germany, unfortunately, today, these days as well, and she's been through her own personal hell as well, and um, she has a great definition of that uh, necrophilic desire that she has observed in this country here, and she, and I would like to quote her now, um, she coins it as, quote, a necrophilic desire of German institutions, um, a necrophilic desire to dissect pieces of history and their people Uh, which it has neutralized and fossilized in a vague, infinite past. It likes to study Palestinian resistance 20, 30, or 40 years later after the Palestinian resistance has been safely stored in its white archives, domesticated, silenced, and fetishized. And I really love this end of quote, and I really love this um, definition of hers because it kind of pins down and, like, and, and exemplifies what happens to you. Because even if we get attacked, and we've, I think me and my co-curators or um, allies or other people, we got attacked so many times. And when you then realize how the media, for instance, or institutions treat you, they usually don't even talk to you, right? You're, you're already this dissected, domesticated, silenced object of hatred. Um, and then very often, uh, what actually happens is that usually an Israeli, very interesting as well, not a German Jew, an Israeli is then questioned or uh, 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 gets to comment on what you might think. And that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, 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 dynamic that I seem to um, observe over and over again, um, where you kind of realize that what she is talking about here is that Palestinians only are operated or only operate apparently in a white, through this white gaze, through this uh, uh, idea of already being dead and not, there's no need for anyone to discuss with us or to engage with us. And if there's someone else, it's usually either a white or a settler colonial subjectivity that gets to define you uh, or your legitimacy to speak. And that's the, I think that is what she um, wants to point out and that is what I meant. 
Yes. Okay, and, and if I may add, also mm. saying all the, who gets to decide on mm -hmm. what is relevant to the conversation, because mm -hmm. if we go back to the Nagba day, mm -hmm. you did have quite a lot of things in the German media about it, but at no point have they explained what is the Nagba? Mm -hmm. Why are people going out to protest? No person who actually went to the protest, you know, of the thousands, nobody even gets interviewed and asked, so why are you here? Yes. And it's it's that erasure mm -hmm. of like, of the meaning that also people give, you know, to their actions, to why we are here, to mm -hmm. what matters, and you know, and like their lives and their agenda is like in just entirely like the erased from the from the conversation yes. as they are. Yes. And I also still remember going to demonstrations back in the day, like 10 years ago or something. And then you would see the media, how they report on a demonstration, usually when Raza was getting bombed, for instance. Um, and they would pick out the young Shabab, you know, 16, 17, sure. you know, angry. And they filmed them and uh, they wanted to have a conversation with them. And then, I, but, you know, me and a couple of other people, you know, we chimed in. It was like, hey, you can talk to us. You know, we can give you, um, we can give you an interview as well, you know. And they look at you. Like the media, the journalists looked at you like up and down. Like, no, you're not the person I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Because they want a certain representation um, uh, instead of actually a, com a, a conversation. right? And That's a representation of their own fantasy. A, a representation of their own fantasy. Exactly. Of a young Arab man that is dangerous, that comes across as dangerous and aggressive. That's exactly what they want, and everything else just doesn't even get represented. And, you know, if I, if I can relate to it from, like, how, how does the marginalized group relate to the state? Because you mentioned the good Palestinians and bad Palestinians, and, I mean, we know it very well from good Jews and bad Jews, but we also know it from, you know, century-old constructs like good women and bad women. And I, I think... I mean, yesterday was Rosh Hashanah, and one of the things we were drinking for is like for the freedom to be who we are. And I think that's actually really relevant about who has the power to tell you who and what you are allowed to be, what is your identity, what is what counts as discrimination or as oppression. And I can say, you know, like from my experience, just um, being really, um, you know, taken aback and amazed by this entire industry of state offices throughout Germany that are responsible for anti-Semitism and the vast majority are not led by, not only are they, uh, the people representing the state themselves are not Jews, but they can still be the highest authority on what anti-Semitism is. So it's like you have this entire industry in Germany of these uh, state institutions that are responsible to fight anti-Semitism and protect Jewish life. And they are led um, not only not necessarily by Jewish people, but also uh, by people who can be center or right wing. Mm -hmm. And it's just entirely detached from any anti-racist framework. This, um, you know, you, this, this power, you know, not o only over people, but over discourse, over ideology, over what constitutes racism, so, or anti-Semitism in that case. Um, and I think there's something there. And, and, I, and I wonder if that's part of kind of the, the, tra the tragedy, like a Jewish tragedy here, mm -hmm. of, um, and, but also of many other minorities who have experienced a lot of, you know, state violence and horrors. Of, of state terrorism and state oppression, and then they come to a place where you hope to see the state as your protector. And you enter this kind of deal <laughs> with the state where you get the promise of protection, because I believe it is only an illusion of protection, and then maybe you get some, some protections, you get special treatment, you get this kind of... But one of the things you give away is, is the freedom to be you know, your own master, to be your own, to be a political subject, to have your own independent voice. And you have, in order to get that protection, or as I argue, illusion of protection, you basically sign up to be what the state allows you to be. And mm -hmm. they tell you, for example, that to be a good Jew, you need to support the Israeli state and be a Zionist um, and, and all of that, right? And And I think that's also why kind of in the beginning I said it's, Like there's something personal, but there's also like a bunch of collective stories here that are unique, but are also interconnected because I think there's something there in the logic mm -hmm. of the kind of state violence and state oppression. And I mean, I know you mentioned that for many 
people, what we are saying would make absolutely no sense. But it's like with the police, right? Like you, until you get beat up by the police one day, you can totally live all your life with the illusion that the police is there to protect you. Yeah, it depends on whom you're asking, right? I mean, I think if you if you grow up in this country as a white middle class person, you probably think that the police is there to, for your protection if you adhere to all the, you know, if you're cisgendered, everything. I mean, there's, there's, there needs to be so many things in place already for you to believe right. that. But interestingly enough, you know, like due to state hom homogeneity and uh, the nation state project, I think that has been... Um, that is the actual citizen, the white heteronormative uh, middle class white... Um, white subject um so yeah and what you said is that our political identities are under attack and i really like the part about um um about anti-semitism that you said as well i think there's also a historical line to be to be drawn to the bit between the jewish zombie that was killed right and the palestinian zombie that is being killed as some kind of i mean i do use zombies as a the metaphysical explanation for the incorporation of people of color into the nation state modernity and colonialism Right. So how do we incorporate these people the entire time? And what do we do if they don't really do what we want them to do? Right. Then they're basically there to be to be killed. That's the whole project, in fact, of modernity, like to decide who gets to be human and who gets to be um, the animal that can be um, disposed of. And then you call it inclusion. Exactly. And then you call it inclusion. And what you said, actually supporting like Jews are only um, accepted as um, as political subjects to take To, to take part in this project uh, if you support Zionism. I think you can say the same thing for everybody, even Palestinians. If, as long yeah. as you support Zionism, you're a good, you actually become a human, right? So uh, white supremacy today basically means supporting Zionism, which means Zionism means humanity, <laughs> and non-Zionism or anti-Zionism basically means today in the public discourse that you do not support humanity. And that's the crazy part. I think this is the stigma and the the badge of of guilt that you referred to before that gets stuck on us in very different logics. I think a Jewish subject still has more rights to speak and represent themselves than a Palestinian in Germany or in Europe today. But still, I think uh, you know if if we continue the system to grow to grow even longer, you know I don't I don't want to see the future. You know I think we are repeating a lot of structures that we've seen already before, at least historically speaking. Uh, and I think one of the challenges is just, um, so I fully agree with you on the hierarchy of who is allowed to speak, but I feel our problem is also that the people are not listening. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the, like, I think it was in Germany that I have experienced what does it mean to speak to someone who just like sees you as a thin air. Mm -hmm. It's like they're, they're looking at you, but you're entirely transparent and you're speaking very clearly mm -hmm. and expressing your thoughts. And it's just not, it's like, hitting a wall because when people have such a narrow perception mm -hmm. of who, who you are um, and you know and kind of your function in their own identity in their own history and this is they need you to be a certain person and when you are saying well but actually I'm my own person and this is what I think and this is my voice mm -hmm. um, in, in such a racialized um, system, then you really you become a thin air. So I think it's it's actually from here that also the idea of zombie really does make sense. Yeah, and it's also a part. Uh, sorry, did you want to just to chime in real quick? But it's it's very much a thingification of you know, and that is why we we need to draw um, um, you know similarities or at least understand history really <laughs> as to what happened, not necessarily in terms of the event itself, but as a structure. Um, and to this kind of thingification is an outcome of modernity. So whatever happened um, here during the Second World War and whatever happened in the colonies cannot really be separated from each other because people have been thingified. So no, no matter how people were looked at, that's part of racism that they stand in front of you and they don't understand you, right? Because you're not, you're always differently, you, you're always mis misrecognized, misinterpolated. And that is literally the structure of what racism and thingification does to you, right? You're not a real human. You're not really capable of representing yourself. Yeah, and it's the, the white German person who also have the authority, for example, right. in my case, to lecture me on anti-Semitism. Right. And if I have something to say in politicizing the personal experience, kind of the, the usual white supremacist point would be, well, but it's not about identity. You know, it's mm -hmm. about the value or the idea. Um, and then you are entirely erased as an authority on your own life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the institutions have their own frame 
uh, that is very mm -hmm. narrowed. And yeah. I think in Europe and even beyond, there is an institutionalization of a certain politicized perception of what is anti-Semitism. Um, and I want to talk about the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which is one of the tools deployed to, to do that, and that just erases uh, any Palestinian narrative, identity, and reality. Um, and here again, we go back to Rias, uh, which is an actor uh, um, important, uh, that play an important role there. Uh, and just to go back a bit on, on the IHRA definition itself, um, now it has been integrated into EU policy. Shall we just say that IHRA is the International Holocaust yeah. Remembrance <laughs> Association and that they have developed this definition of anti-Semitism that is very clear on how almost anything critical you say of the Israeli state can be uh, understood as anti-Semitism. So it's hugely controversial from any perspective except from the perspective of the state and the fact that you have hundreds of scholars, including experts on the Holocaust and anti-Semitism saying that this working definition is not valid, it still has this really huge institutional weight because it gives this political legitimacy of science. We already talked about academia and science, right? Um, so it kind of builds on that academic or semi-scientific capital to justify political persecution. Yeah, and the thing is that now it's part of the EU strategy to combat anti-Semitism, so there is no other narrative than this uh, IHRA definition now, and it's been institutionalized in um, many European uh, states, and it increasingly, increasingly um, has a de facto binding effect on um, on us, on, on any individual who uh, uh, will talk about Israel-Palestine now. And the, the issue is that, as you said, it's highly controversial and because mostly because there were those examples that, you know, like are so-called manifestations of anti-Semitism that were attached to, to this definition. <coughs> These examples are not even a part of, the defi of this definition and the IHRA itself has made clear that this is the definition and the example are, uh, are separated. But they are constantly bring, being brought back, sorry, brought back, back into the, the debate and, and, and automatically attached to this definition. And they are uh, being used, for instance, to say that calling Israel an apartheid state uh, is anti-Semitic or saying that uh, Israel is committing a genocide against Palestinian people is anti-Semitic. So this is highly problematic. And also another thing is that the definition has never been incorporated into legislations, you mm. know, into national legislations. Mm. So there is this... Semi-formal state Yeah, of this quasi-legal uh, policy, again, that is actually having concrete restrictions on fundamental rights, including the freedom of expression, um, that, it, you know, free, academic freedom, artistic freedom, and so on, and also non-discrimination. Um, so it has become a real binding instrument without saying uh, uh, its name. And I can name a few examples. I don't know if you want to jump no, in no, before, ahead. but um, I mean, in the case of Anna, uh, Rias, so, okay, Rias Berlin was involved, but Rias Federal Association, which is the umbrella organization um, in which Rias Berlin is, is a chapter, basically, um, Rias is a major promoter of the IHRA definition and uh, at the EU level itself because the European Commission has uh, choose, uh, chosen uh, Rias to, 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 um, to write this handbook uh, that is you know, uh, supposed to help European member states uh, to use uh, the IHRA definition in order to fight anti-Semitism. Uh, a handbook that has been criticized by many, many uh, civil society actors and we also as the LSE have concluded that it uh, amounts to misinformation. Mm -hmm. And maybe, yeah, just also the, the Deutsche Welle case, um, you know, like those seven Arab employees were fired, apparently based on an in independent investigation that was led by uh, Ahmad Mansour, you, you, you talked about him, and this relates to again, which Palestinian has the right yeah. to uh, speak or not. And he used the IHR definition uh, to assess anti-Semitism also here. Uh, Judicious Timur, uh, the organization you yeah. are part of, uh, 
face yeah, I news mean, and also you know translate. when you have a bank account yeah, yeah. in, a, in our case account. it started already before the IHRA mm -hmm. definition yes. became a thing but it was um, then shortly following uh, this BD and the BDS resolution which also didn't of the Bundestag which did not have legal weight yeah. but was still politically used as if it had it yes. right um, and Speaking of, you know, kind of fascist or now fascist kind of trends, mm -hmm. there was an expectation, like a request for us that if we wanted to keep our bank account, um, we had to sign a paper for the bank, you know, saying that we are, um, you know, we don't support BDS. <laughs> so this kind of political censorship yeah. is, um, yeah, and again, you know, it's such a shame, all the time and money and energy and resources and like literally time of our lives you know mm -hmm. that nobody will give us back right. go, going back on this on, 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 on this type of, uh, of persecution and which is crazy is that at some point when the bank decided to assess if your organization was anti-semitic or not they appointed an expert <laughs> that would have you know use this IHRA definition to assess if the organization was anti-semitism or not and Hopefully. Yeah, clear, clearly we said no thank yeah. you uh, yeah. without the thank you. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's this um, also completely disconnecting anti-Semitism from Jews, for example, and making it about this rhetorical superiority on some, you know, theoretical issue, but also just not only entirely disconnecting it from anti-racism, but just using it in the service of racism. And it was actually one of my experiences of feeling thin air was trying to engage with the EU, with the relevant uh, decision makers and institutions um, to be very clear, um, you know, that I mean, also we as the Jewish Voice for Peace and many other Jewish organizations, are, like we are not protected by that. We are actually attacked um, mm -hmm. But there was absolutely no interest in that. And, and we actually got a lecture on what anti-Semitism is. So, you know, that's, I, think, I think that that's, that's a very good example of what happens when state authorities kind of, you know, give you the illusion that they're going to protect you, even if protection means that they actually persecute you de facto. Yeah, so another example of... Um these anti-Semitism accusations, how it plays out institutionally, I think is the Documenta case, which is uh, more internationally famous by now. Um, and I think it mirrors this colonial extraction very well, because the collective that was hired, Juan Gupa, um, is from the Global South. The topic was decolonialism. <laughs> and uh, uh, so you basically go to the colony, extract knowledge and wisdom and art and whatever you want and brown buddies, um, and then when they come here and exhibit what they want to exhibit based on, you know, the contracts and what they were told to do. And here we also understand that decolonialism for a lot of European institutions is just another buzzword. Um, people actually become so repulsed. And I read an article recently as well that said, well, if this is the opinion of, the, of uh, post-colonial decolonial thought, then we don't need it here in Europe, quote. Um, and I think that is kind of paradigmatic of what happened um, there and uh, mirrors the, the reversing of material power structures as well. So we extract logics and people and buddies, and then we don't want them. But I guess you have more to say about, about the um, yeah, no, documenta I agree. case. Okay. But yeah. And again, we, we apply this colonial tool on them, again, using the IHRA definition to investigate into potential anti-Semitism within Documenta. Right. Again, the Palestinian collectives are being targeted there, uh, and they did not just face mirrors, they faced vandalism, death threats, um, uh, assaults, uh, cyber attacks, harassment on social media, and so on. And, and there is this scientific ad advisory panel who came into the conversation at some point to say that, oh, uh, wait, this is anti-Semitism because you're talking about apartheid. Oh, you said the word genocide. According to the IHRA definition, this is anti-Semitism. Again, we always go back, but we, we, it comes to ridiculous assumptions in the so-called scientific panel statement or preliminary report where um, it goes to say that um, another exhibition from uh, talking about uh, um, Femme des Luttes en Algérie, uh, because there was 
I'm sorry, I need to tell this example because it's just like crazy. There was this leaflet or paper uh, kind of envelope with the, the map of Palestine and, and written uh, for the genocide to stop. Mm-hmm. Only this was mm-hmm. taken as an example of anti-Semitism by this panel because of this IHRA definition uh, example that um, uh, refers to, you know, equating uh, Israeli policies with uh, Nazi Germany's uh, anti-Semitism. So that goes very, very far. Um, And I think just to demonstrate the hypocrisy that while this whole thing was going around Documenta, elsewhere you had a Jewish man having a law, uh, a, um, a legal case um, on a church that was presenting um, horrible anti-Semitic frescoes from I don't know which century mm-hmm. with like a religious Jewish man and a pig in some kind of sexual encounter and like the request was not even to destroy it but to put it like from the public space from the church like to a museum at least to have it in some context and he lost the case because you can really see how those you know freedom of expression and all of this like whom it is serving and whom it is protecting Um, so, I mean, it's, it's just that the hypocrisy is, is just mind-blowing because that case of actual, you know, like, like actual people be- being um, experiencing actual anti-Semitism in the public space was entirely not interesting and almost not mentioned in the media at all, plus the case was lost. Yeah. And I think it also signals to... If, if one thinks about it, it also signals to Jews that, well, A, this is not about, this discourse of anti-Semitism is not about Jews anyways, right? But it also signals to Jews, if we just assumed it was about anti-Semitism and Jews, it also signals to Jews that, look, the state is not going to protect you unless you are a Zionist and subscribe to our white political uh, definition of and whatever we think of however we want to interpret the past. And if you don't agree with that then you're basically back to where we were before. <laughs> and that's, the, that's, the, that's the, um, the very scary part of that, I think, even just from a, a Jewish perspective. Um, but I think what it also leads, did you want to say something else about that? Or what it also leads to, I think, in Germany, a country that, has, um, that always refers back to its past when it kind of comes at us with these debates. Um, and it's, one of the things that I learned in school, I don't know, maybe you learn something else, but I always learned this, this anticipatory obedience, voraus uh, allender Gehorsam, in German, which was, right, the, the Mitläufer, the bystander, the people who basically just were onlookers to a system that, you know, got hijacked by a couple of Nazis or something. Um, and that is just something that we are politically raised with, in a way. Nobody really goes into elaborating how that played out, what did that really mean, you know, everybody just tells you it was about the economy, and then, you know, six million Jews got killed in Sinti and Roma. Okay, that was a, that's a, like the short version of the whole story. But what happens in between, right? So now we have a country that uses its past based on um, uh, uh, its supposed overcoming of that past, and still we have the same problem of anticipatory obedience um, in this country the minute we are debating this again. So actually for me, the, the scary part, the chilling effect, if I might want to say that, of this political apartheid that is getting um, extended uh, and more, more violent with every day almost, is that I can today very vividly imagine Uh, before that, it was more an abstract understanding. I can today imagine how people were, you know, dragged out of their uh, apartments and paraded through the streets and people looking on. Like, I can totally see that. And I think that is something that people don't, um, uh, don't really understand in terms of a structural continuation of sorts, that it does not need to have the same names and the same people in power in order for things to appear in a similar way to the people affected. Um, so yeah, this uh, anticipatory obedience um, works, however, today not you know, through an illusion of Nazi rule, that people are scared of the Gestapo or the SS or the SA, but more through narratives of German guilt because of the Gestapo and the SA and the SS and everything. So it kind of plays on these ideas. Um, so yeah, we have a narrative shift that um, essentially psychologizes material structures. Um, of uh, present politics of colonialism between Palestine and Germany to date. Yeah. 
And also you do have still cases of, you know, ongoing state violence. I mean, you do have today people who are dragged out of their homes and maybe not paraded through the streets, but t- taken, you know, straight to Lagos or to the airport and being deported. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, and, and, the, and, and the society is organized in a way that, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, bogus, like, mm-hmm. you know, well-behaved citizen can continue their lives. Right. Um, in in this like complete apathy and like this yes. uh, engineered ignorance yep. of of how life in this place really mm-hmm. is for a lot of people who are not in a privileged situation. Right. Thank you so much. And I think white liberalism really comes comes into play there as well because white liberals constantly think that this structure actually works, and this is an exception, right? Like the refugee who violated the rules. Um, or the, the few bad apples in the army. Exactly. Not like systematic war crimes, just, you know, a couple of bad apples. Exactly. Yes. It was, was there, it's, it's okay that they were targeted. Yes. And that's how it started as well. I mean, that's, that's been something that we've seen during colonial rule. Even in pre-colonial Germany, we've seen this bit. Yeah. And, you know, maybe just, sorry, just running ahead yes. of ourselves, yeah. but I think it also very brings us, you know, to personal responsibility and what we do with the fear that we actually, we can feel because it is engineered in a way to make us afraid and sometimes with very good reasons and with a lot of institutional yes. power that can be used against us. Yes. And we'll sorry. get back to that in a second. Yeah. I just have two questions that I want to come back to. One mm. thing you said before uh, that was like a little bit on the side, but I want to come back to that. You said that there have been cases, popular cases, um, of Palestinians that actually went, you know, went against this kind of repression and kind of also won. And you said that the reason for that, or you, you assume that the reason for that was also their, um, their, if I understand it correctly, their class position mm. somehow. Can you elaborate on this a little bit? What do you mean by that? Why, uh, these more popular cases, why were they different than what is normally going on? Well, that's, that's me taking a leap of, uh, you know, of interpretation right now. But um, in order to stand up to the system, not only emotionally and psychologically, which is already uh, a huge burden, and you know, whereas other people continue with their lives, you know, you you kind of end up with this, um, like yeah, chain to you. It's kind of mm. like you, you drown with it, you know, and either you're a really good swimmer or you're not. Um, but what I meant by by that is that it it is a class issue of how much you understand. Um, or are able to understand what is happening, understand the material structure of of rule. Um, there is, a, you know, that is that all of that takes a lot of politicization, a lot of time, you know, like, and you need to know the right people. So if we look at um, uh, precarious. Uh, third generation, second generation Palestinians in this country. The migration of Palestinians to to Germany is, you know, one of um, uh, you either have, like the majority of Palestinians in this country, let's put it that way, are uh, refugees of war, particular the Lebanese wars, but also in Palestine. So we do ha- have already a population in its majority that um, uh, has until today not the same access to structures of power, plus you already are confronted with anti-Muslim racism, with anti-Palestinian racism, as some people call it, um, uh, to actually have a voice, right? So if you get beaten up, for instance, in one of the Nakba demonstrations, I don't know if you are going to talk about that later on or if you already did talk about that, where basically the kafia was used as a reason to be, um, to be fined right, and taken into custody. So you're wearing the Palestinian scarf and that is already a sign of criminality. right? Now imagine... Now imagine this kind of, you know, like subjectivity being able to represent themselves or talk back to a state structure that comes at you with this abundance of, you know, like knowledge that they have put into the laws that they basically described and wrote. And now they're using them against you. Right. So you're constantly catching up with something. So it is a class structure for us to be able to understand, articulate ourselves, speak German properly enough. You know, all of these things. This this is what matters, really. You know, the way you look, the way you dress, what is your uh, educational background? I'm an academic and I'm, I, I know, I mean, with a PhD, whatever, not that this matters, but it does matter because people still, even in my own profession, have asked friends of mine, is she really an anti-Semite? People that I, want, that I work with have been told, don't publish something with this person. It's, it could be bad for your career. I don't know any of these people. 
you know? So imagine if this is being done to someone uh, that does not have access to these, you know, kind of civility moments of PhD and university and, you know, fluent German and all of that, you know? Like, it's just, uh, they're going to come down at you. But also Ramses Kilani ca uh, ca Kilani's case, um, uh, where he basically sued the German um, uh, government for not... Um, pursuing and investigating into the de death of his family, right? Um, it's also quite paradigmatic. I mean, it really says that we are second class, if we even are citizens, right? You can, I think it's just a, a mere symbolic moment of, of citizenship, you know? Um, so the German state has def de uh, decided or has repealed, I think, or rejected um, any investigation into the death of his uh, father and uh, kids and wife, Um According to international law, that should have happened, and it doesn't, because apparently it's not important if Palestinians with the German citizenship in Gaza are being killed. That's it, you know? So now imagine someone from, you know, Neukölln, like, going through all of these institutions, hmm. you know, getting a lawyer, like, uh, this is... Yeah. I don't know. No. Well, let, alone, <laughs> let alone all the money that that costs. Also. Yeah, and then you're getting beaten up by the police. Mm -hmm. But thank you for coming, bringing up this case, Anna, because it's true. I, I forgot to mention it, but um, even without going out with their café, there were Palestinians or people who were going to this uh, Nakba Day commemoration were inherently treated as being violent even and dangerous. Just, even just standing on the sidewalk, yes. not even yeah, inside the demo. Even standing on I the mean, sidewalk. Yeah. The, the ban from the police was a preemptive ban, so it was mm -hmm. like also in the, you can read the decision because there were Palestinians or because there were people with uh, Arab or Muslim background. Well, the police, the institutions, the state will start from the premises that those people are dangerous and will purport hate speech uh, mm -hmm. uh, against Israel or Jewish people. And mm -hmm. this is racism. It, not yeah. only it's a, it's a problem for, uh, you know, like fundamental rights because a preemptive ban on, on, on people who wish, to, who wish to, you know, just peacefully assemble is, is a collective uh, punishment on a, on a community. But it's also just racism, uh, actually. And, and can I say that mm -hmm. I, I, ha I have experienced that this, you know, May 15th this year as, 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 an, as another step, as another level of the intimidation in the public space, mm -hmm. because it wasn't anymore about, okay, well, I go to this demonstration and it's going to be mm -hmm. violently dispersed. It was, even if I'm not going to any particular action, but it's just we are out there and we happen to be to be on the street and happen to be Palestinians or care about freedom for Palestine and have any kind of symbol, then we can be detained as people have been detained mm -hmm. massively. Yes. And, and I think, again, we're coming back to the German guilt trope here, right? Um, although this is all uh, a structural racism already, but I think this German guilt trope also kind of ushers in this gaslighting discourse of white supremacy where they invert colonial power structures And they create this kind of, you know, guilty versus the non-guilty Manichaean world, right? So there's the, the, the Palestinian is already guilty, by definition. Whether you stand on the side, what, what, when, you, when you represent yourself, you're already guilty by definition. AKA, again, like this, this example that people, even in academia, even if you have a PhD and you've, you know, you're published in everything, people can just simply go and read you if they want to. But still, uh, they think you are guilty of something because otherwise... This could not have happened, right? So we have this guilty versus non-guilty Manichean logic that comes in, right? Um, and that defines Palestinian already by definition as wrong, as guilty, and as not being allowed on the streets nor in your institution. And I think this is where we're talking about colonial erasure. This is really, this is why it's apartheid. And apartheid is uh, an outcome. It is not a subcategory, you know? It is one of... Uh, of, of, of um, legal definitions. For me, apartheid in particular, I would, again, Biko's definition of political apartheid, not legal apartheid, is an outcome of colonial rule, is an outcome of, uh, 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 of genocide. We cannot understand apartheid, you know, apart from that. It doesn't make, at least academically and historically, it does not make sense. And in the way it was practiced, whether that is South Africa or in Palestine today, it also doesn't make any sense to separate it um, in terms of, of, of debate. And... Um, so, yeah, it's basically about erasing Palestine, erasing Palestinian bodies. Um, and through this erasure, uh, at the same time, you also create the society that constantly uh, obeys 
<laughs> the sovereign in their definition of who is allowed to live, which is why we need to disobey a little bit more. And also what I also want to say or like to, to add to that, I think we are, and that, that is why I was talking about modernity and colonial rule, basically what we are witnessing is a system that is use, using IRA as a rationalization tactic, although all of these, uh, everything that we're talking about here now is not new. It also didn't start in 2018 uh, with Peter Schiefer or the Bembe affair. Um, it didn't start there, no. <laughs> um, but we do see now that there is a system that uses laws now. It, make, it, it comes up with quasi-legal laws, which we call usually in political science policies, right? Which then enter the law again to kind of deal with the same population that they have dealt with before in the same manner, but without the institutional logic that can rationalize it yet. So we see a system that learns um, and that kind of goes into quasi-legal and then legal frames or pathways to implement it again and make it a part of a democratic structure, right? Um, that is something that I wanted to say. And also, uh, RIAS, I think what, it, what, what was left out so far is that German institutions like RIAS or IPSA, for instance, um, have been at the forefront of uh, not only developing material around anti-Semitism, although IRA came in a little later, you know, but they have been at the forefront on the German as well as EU institutional level way before 2020, you know. Um, that is the reason why now the majority of um, anti-Semitism delegates <laughs> somehow are white German Protestants mm. yeah. on the EU level lecturing the Jewish Voice for Peace about what anti-Semitism means, right? So we have people like uh, uh, Katharina von Schnurbein. Um, I think the name already says a lot. Um, it, it, it's, it's striking to me how people with a background of white German aristocracy, whether that's true or not, at least the name is still there, uh, can lecture a Jewish group about the history and present and past of anti-Semitism. It's, it's really striking to me. Um, but that is where we are at. And we have somehow come, um, the system has, has reached a level where people take this as a sign of good governance, interestingly enough. Right? So when you talk to people outside of Europe, they either don't understand what's going on or they think it's just completely mad. And then the first conclusion is, oh, it's because of German guilt. I do think that it's really important to dispel this myth of the German guilt. Yes, please. Because I feel like guilt is like on a very basic human level. It's like when you understand you did something wrong. Right, and then you are open to acknowledge that, and to hear, the, and to see, to, to acknowledge, to hear the other person, to understand their perspective. But if still the only thing that you are able to see, like there's some some humility that comes with that. But if the only person that you are able to see is yourself and your emotions and your own issues, and you are at the center of the universe, like there is no guilt there. I feel there is just the same version of supremacy mm -hmm. and an attempt to maybe gain some kind of moral supremacy. Mm -hmm. But like, if you're not really able to see the other, like, I'm not going to give you the satisfaction of saying, oh, well, it's just because you're a good person and you're capable of guilt. Like, I'm sorry, if you're not able to see the other person, it's still supremacy. Um, yeah. And I think what is also maybe for the audience important to know is that racism is still a power structure. So we cannot really say it's important to understand that racism works through the law, through the economy, through education, and it usually defines a certain hegemony or dominant structure or people that can uh, uh, wager this leverage, right? So uh, a brown or black person from the ghetto cannot really be discriminatory to a white person that comes into the ghetto because they do not control the structures of who gets what loan, gets to move where, gets to go to university, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is basically how we should, and this is how racism is understood in academia, as a power structure. Otherwise, it would just be, I'm a racist, you're a racist, it's naturalized, it's, de it's dehistoricized, um, and then we're basically just having some kind of um, uh, uh, match game going on. Um, so that's one thing. And what you said is, uh, what you refer to as these structures of white supremacy, it's true because um, just recently, and I think in, 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 in summary of this year, Joe Biden traveled to Israel for his Middle East uh, 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 you know, visit, whatever. Um, and he said in his opening speech, right, I don't know if you've seen that, but it's still uh, quite uh, kind of um, indicative of everything that we're talking about, aka Zionism, meaning humanity, meaning, meaning white supremacy at the same time. He literally said something we all know, but one does not need to be a Jew 
to be a Zionist. And then he goes on congratulating Israel. Um, you can read it on the whitehouse.gov <laughs> website, Joe Biden, summer, July 2020 or uh, June 2020. Um, and I think that is, again, a part of colonial erasure, which tackles Jews just the same as it tackles Palestinians. Although I do still believe, you know, in their political identity, I think Palestinian voices and lives don't matter, whereas, you know, Jewish uh, or Israeli voices who are against that system at least get to decide or get to speak once in a while, sometimes even get to decide which Palestinians get to speak. But yeah. Yeah. And I think like tools like the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism is um, really a constraint continuation of this colonial repression that people are facing in Palestine, but within Europe, you know, like it's really imposing Israel's discourse into European politics and legal frameworks. And it's because those tools, such as also we didn't talk about anti-BDS resolutions, but mm -hmm. because they are heavily, they are being heavily promoted uh, in part from uh, um, Israel advocacy groups but also institutions themselves. Um, and because they are being treated as authoritative by the, the institutions, then they become de facto binding. Right. And I just want to reiterate again that it's very concerning for um, uh, the rights of the Palestinians and, and the rights of uh, other human rights defenders in, in Europe and yeah, just simply our fundamental rights to freedom of expression. Yeah, I would even go as far as saying, connecting it to what we said before as political apartheid that is working on a transnational level by now. IRA is a tool of political apartheid, of transnational political apartheid. That is exactly how you move from the colony to outside the colony um, or vice versa. Um, yeah, so my, my last question before we get maybe to some closing comments would be, What's the purpose of all this? I mean, you've been talking about, you talked mm. about political economy before. We know, you know, Palestinian erasure, repression, yeah. um, feigning uh, guilt and uh, using these discourses to completely, you know, um, shut down any, any kind of dissenting voices. But what's like, if we, if we, if we think of a political economy, we, we think maybe on the state level, maybe even global politics, what do you think, if you were like to give an answer now or, you know, just brainstorm about it, what would, be the purpose of all this? Why is this happening? Of, of what? Of us sitting here and talking back or of them coming to crush down on us? Yeah, second. Um, I mean, you know, I think colonial, I think the project of modernity from the very inception has been an economic, uh, an economic one, which, which means that you allocate a lot of economic, political, social, cultural resources in the hands of a few, <laughs> whether that is the 1% as the anti-capitalists are saying, right, or whether that is kind of what uh, critical race scholars would, would, would describe as white supremacy, um, which is not necessarily only about color, FYI. I think Germans really, um, or Europeans, very often, um, um, I think we need to become literate as a society. That's also very important about what race actually means and what racism means, um, um, which is something that we have not really caught up with. And now that we have decolonial and anti-racist, um, precariously employed very often people of color or people speaking about it, we see this trend of political apartheid coming and cracking back on us to kind of kick us out again. So we are trying to teach this kind of language and history to people um, and, and in order to change something for the future. But uh, now we're being kicked out. And I think the goal is simply that, you know, to maintain Europe as a a space of, as Fanon would call it, the, you know, a space of, a space for the, you know, of life, you know, this is where humanity lives, you know, this is uh, the zone of being, you know, where the law applies, where we have uh, um, a political economy that pays for your health insurance, <laughs> you know, so it's basically the opposite of the colony. Um, and that is what we are, we're looking at in a, at a time of, you know, um, natural destruction, um, where, questions of who gets to live in a space like literally as a human will matter even more so this is not just about palestine palestine is just the figure that is used uh to kind of really get rid of a huge trope of anti-decolonial um anti-sexist a lot of progressive ideas that we've worked for um uh, for the past you know 60 80 years um are now being kind of torn apart 
with this narrative, amongst other things, right? There are many other narratives that do that as well. But um, another reason why we are sitting here, and maybe I think the two of them want to say something as well, I think why we are sitting here now talking back is because the settler, colonial, or modernity project never intended to really talk to us. <laughs> you know, settler colonialism or apartheid, although a lot of people think that this is all about dialogue and peace and love, and, you know, the Palestinian and the Israeli Jew, they just need to sit together and, 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 and drink tea and coffee and then, I don't know, move, go to New York for a weekend trip and then discover their own humanity and then they won't shoot each other in, anymore, right? This is, this is complete, this is ludicrous. There is, has been no colonial or settler colonial uh, or racial project generally that was interested in talking to its subjects. Like none. Like I really want someone to show me a historical example where someone, where a slave or a colonially subdued uh, uh, person or an indigenous person, I hate that word indigenous, a native um, from wherever in the world was kind of asked, oh, how do you feel about me taking your land, raping your women and, uh, and, and killing your family? Do you have to say anything about that? Do you want to start writing national laws with us after we have founded the United States of America or Australia or South Africa, whatever, you name it? That, doesn't, that does not exist. So that is, um, yeah, that is, I think, something where I'm coming back to, to Biko's definition of, uh, or critique of white liberalism again, because um, uh, a lot of the structures that we are facing right now are an outcome of this white liberal compromise where more radical voices or understandings of, of, of the structure have been silenced uh, because we want to have this very nice liberal notion of everybody being at peace and loving each other um, and because we have kicked out all the radical voices, right? Um, so yeah, it's all about narrative control. I think that is what, what, what the structure is about. That's why we're sitting here and t hopefully talking back through something that is um, cannot be... Um, Silenced or oh, oh, we can be yeah. silenced. Uh, maybe not <laughs> silenced, but we're trying to. <laughs> I don't know. We're trying. Yeah. And you know, I was thinking about yeah. the same kind of peace and love narrative because yeah. I think, I think in a way, what is happening is that we have a society of profound inequalities, like also historical and, and yet the society is trying to uphold a certain narrative of equality. Um, you know, injustice and peace and yes. human rights and democracy, um, you know, because that's kind of also the package within which we are getting capitalism and all of that. And then I think whenever we are exposing the leakage of the narrative, um, then the system is kind of trying to put in place, you know, like all kinds of things to stop the leak. Like, for example, this dossier about Anna and all the other dossiers about the rest of us that we are still to find out, you know, what's written in those and where are they. And, you know, it's like you have this peace and human rights discourse in the reality of like growing militarization budgets or you have, you know, discourse of economic growth when it's like reality of like growing poverty and exploitation or, you know, environment and Paris climate agreements when actually you have a whole corporate and state system destroying the ecology and the planet completely all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something there also that, I mean, actually, actually like to our credit, to our achievement, that we are being successful in many ways in exposing the injustices and the oppression. And you have movements like Black Lives Matter, you know, that, yes, that, that you. have made yes. also, you know, um, the connection to Palestine liberation as well, right? And so you have all those forces, and then you have the system being so desperate that it comes to those, you know, not even hidden, but outright, you know, anti-democratic, neo-fascist means um, of trying to, you know, to put us kind of under the table. And um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think I think that's that's for me would be like would be would be one way of, of answering that. Okay, cool. And another thing, because you mentioned Black Lives Matter, and it's it's true. Um, it, it's very important, I think, to point that out. I think um, without the U.S. American Black Lives Matter movement, I don't even think that here in Germany we would be where we are at. Um, because people somehow, the minute it concerns anti-Semitism, I think, you know, anti-Jewish racism or Jewish lives have been so commodified and thingified already that people don't understand it even as a question of race anymore, really. So when Achille Bembe came here or when, um, when uh, Black Lives Matter um, is uh, expressed from the very get-go, obviously, and from the very beginning, um, their support 
um, for for Palestine or Palestinians, that's when people here, even people of color, um, realized, oh, maybe there is something about this which is colonial and and racist. Because until then, it was just a white German narrative. Um, so I think we would not even be here had Black Lives Matter in the U.S. not um, not you know. Uh, caused so much stir on behalf of Palestinians too. Um, so there is there is a real need for us to understand what race means here um, and how we can substantially be an anti-racist and anti-colonial um, uh, in solidarity with anti-racism and anti-colonialism because you can be anti-racist and not be anti-colonial, which is what a lot of people of color or movements here have usually try to peddle, especially with the question of Palestine, right? I'm anti-racist except Palestine. I'm anti-colonial except Palestine. As well as you can be anti-colonial without being anti-racist, obviously, right? So, um, and I think that is the, the, the problem that I wanted to point out. And I think that was brought together by Black Lives Matter and by the Achille Bembe case um, more than any other case, I think, internationally. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I want to um, shout out. Thank you, guys. Okay, great. So... Um, last question then. How do we continue from here? So what's up next? How do you think um, this should inform what's going to come from now on? <laughs> no, I mean, regarding the case in particular, um, we really, we want accountability, basically. Um, I mean, RIAS, MBR, or any other organization that would have similar practices must know that they just cannot uh, unlawfully process data um, of critical voices only because they oppose their uh, political uh, ideas. And for us, the only acceptable outcome would be that they just stop those uh, practices uh, that violent, violate fundamental uh, freedoms. And we also want to bring this to the attention of the institutions themselves because um, the, the credit that Germany, Europe, uh, and the political space that they give to, to those uh, institutions, and the money as well, um, is, is highly problematic. So they should challenge uh, uh, those organizations as well. And okay, Rias may do uh, a great job in fighting far-right extremism and, and anti-Semitism, for instance, but they cannot keep targeting uh, Palestinian voices and Palestinian rights advocates using surveillance-like practices and narratives that uh, label them as anti-Semites. Um, and yeah, and what is needed also from uh, our perspective is uh, public support, as you said also, uh, uh, Anna, so spread the word on social media, sign the support letter, um, <laughs> donate, because we need money to, to, to do that, uh, to access our right, because challenging those uh, structures, structural issues costs a lot of money. Um, so yeah, uh, we created the crowdfunding page, which is accessible on our um, website, ELSE.support. And uh, yeah, I also want to say to those who uh, will listen is that do not be afraid to speak out um, about Palestinian rights because first it's a fundamental um, issue that must be addressed and second you are not alone um, we can collectively challenge uh, the repression and I insist on the collective uh, we have to support each other um, and yeah we have to to smash this fear uh, from speaking out. Look at Le Leonardo here. No, that's He's Rafael. Afraid. Rafael, mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> Leonardo agrees. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Ina, what do you think? I mean, you know, I think things have been cha changing for the 12 years that I'm here. I mean, it's still in incredible for anyone coming from the US or another country to understand <laughs> what's going on here. But things have been changing. Like, I'm seeing, you know, we are now going to into a week of really impressive mobilizations commemorating 10 years of the Oranian Platz organizing in the refugee movement. We have already several years of anti-colonial alliance Berlin bringing together migrant and uh, BIPOC groups um, organizing together. We have uh, 
a fabulous internationalist queer pride that's anti-colonial and is very political. So also kind of a pushback. Uh, or I'm thinking, for example, about the internationalist uh, feminist alliance. Uh, we have pushback against also this cooptation, you know, of. Uh, progressive issues or women's rights or LGBTQI rights, like in the service of kind of mainstream, um, you know, state agendas. Um, and it, it feels like there's a shift in, I think, what if I'm looking at when I just came here 12 years ago, felt much more kind of white German supremacy and white German dominated. And I think there is a shift in the sense that um, historically, um, People, um, you know, who were not Palestinian <laughs> had the privilege to say, well, this whole thing of like Palestine and Israel, you know, it's not my place or is a German or it's too complicated or, you know, like or we don't want to go into that. And I think what I would like to say is that um, like this privilege of saying, well, you know, I'm not getting involved, like you don't have it anymore. Because the reality is that you have too many Palestinians here, you also have <laughs> a bit more Jews meanwhile. Um, uh, so you have people that it's about their life, and it's about the freedom and the family, and it's, you know, and, and we don't have the privilege to say, well, it's too com complicated for us. And so there is something about shifting, like who is controlling, you know, like who is dominating the boundaries of the discourse of the left? You know, mm -hmm. who gets to say what is a leftist agenda and what mm -hmm. is part of it? Should it be anti-racist? Should it be anti-colonial? Like, who is in, who is out, whose lives are part of this agenda? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, um, yeah, like, it can be scary because, yeah, people do get fired for speaking out and, and people do get, you know, bogged in, like, these long legal processes when you do want to protect your rights. But at the same time, I think it's really important that we support each other, you know, either not to be afraid or, like, let's be afraid, but let's do it anyway, you know, uh, and let's start speaking out about Palestine and, and let's support each other um, because, you know, because it's it's... It's, yeah, like, what, what can I say? I mean, it's, it's about our life, our freedom. It's about, you know, what it means to be human in this society mm -hmm. and what kind of political agency we want to bring. Yeah, I think the, what, what you just said about um, kind of what, what do we have to say about all this and what, what strikes me very often is that, as you said, the, the, the structure is not really interested in listening and hearing. Um, but I think it also, in, in particular when it comes to Palestinian lives in Germany, is that there is this erasure of us as people that have anything to say politically, uh, theoretically, conceptually, um, uh, at all. We are not part of this conversation. I mean, I've also seen moments where, where people even invite people from, like Palestinians from abroad, in order to speak here, right? Because apparently all the other Palestinians here are already too tainted or something yeah. like that. Um, so there is this perpetual erasure of Palestinians in Germany. And I think there's something about this fear that we need to, uh, that we need to address as well, because this is the largest... A, a, a number of Palestinians in Europe in this country and I think that is why we constantly need to erase our existence here so please uh, you know like uh, whether it's journalists or researchers or activists we actually have something to say we can theorize based on what happened to us uh, we've been through this you know most of our lives transgenerationally usually so there is definitely something to add from our side um, that is one thing and obviously institutional support or not institutional support but structures that support us maybe let's put it that yeah. way um, uh, in particular through through funding we you know now we are like talking about these very high class society cases like mine or um, um, a few other people um, but what happens to those who are more precarious more marginalized um, we need to We need to reach out to communities and be able to kind of, so that people know whom to talk to, whom to address. Had the ELSC not uh, come to Berlin to introduce themselves and their work, actually, back in the days when, after my, my, my file appeared, I most likely would have not done anything because I don't mm. have the money for a lawyer. 
um, and all of that stuff that you're basically taking on right now in terms of research and drafting and you know working with my lawyer here. So I'm, I'm very happy because we're institutionally as well as economically completely unsupported, completely alone. Um, and, uh, and, and with all the privileges that we have, I already have difficulties. And I'm, I feel like I'm so incredibly privileged. And yet uh, you see this erasure in terms of what we are putting out, what we are demanding on a regular basis. There's nobody really interested in this. And I think we really need to talk about what is the, the left Who is the left? Are they interested in our voices or are they too scared of being seen with us? You know, um, you cannot, the left becomes like the, 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 the door handler of who is allowed in or not. And I think that needs to really change because we've seen how the white left has betrayed a lot of class struggles before. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks uh, to the three of you for uh, coming back here as the case is still going on. Let's keep in touch and uh, see how it goes. Maybe in another year from now we have another good news or, uh, uh, yeah, fingers pressed. And then uh, thanks to everybody else for watching and listening and we are out. Leute, wir brauchen eure Hilfe. Wenn euch dieses Video gefallen hat, klickt auf Like, abonniert den Kanal und vergesst nicht, das Glöckchen zu drücken, damit ihr benachrichtigt werdet, wenn wir neuen Content droppen. Außerdem solltet ihr uns überall folgen, wo wir verfügbar sind. Das ist Facebook, Instagram, Twitter und Twitch. Und wenn wir irgendwelche Ankündigungen machen oder Posts, dann shared, was das Zeug hält. Gebt uns all eure Liebe. Wir haben mittlerweile ziemlich signifikante Kosten. Wenn ihr es euch irgendwie leisten könnt, unterstützt uns doch auf Patreon. Dann kommt ihr auch in den Genuss verschiedener Vorteile, wie zum Beispiel Zugang zu unserer Discord-Community oder Zugang zu den ultra geheimen Patreon-Episoden, die wir dort posten. Außerdem könnt ihr uns natürlich auch über PayPal Spenden zukommen lassen. Außerdem haben wir mittlerweile einen eigenen Online-Shop. Das heißt, wenn ihr euch immer noch fragt, was ihr euren Lieben zu Weihnachten, Ostern oder sonst wie schenken könnt, geht dorthin und kauft duftes Merch. Alle Links dazu hier in der Beschreibung oder auch auf unserer Webseite 99zu1.de. Vielen Dank fürs Dabeisein, danke für die Unterstützung und wir sehen uns in diesem Theater.